There's 412 fifth grade students, 421 sixth grade students, and there's a whole section less. So, having been a teacher um, and knowing what the difference between 20 kids and 24 kids feels like, I just I just hope that as we move forward and we discuss things like all the kindergarten and everything else, like that we just keep this in mind because I think that you know there's a lot of value to having closer to 20 kids in a class and. You know, 21.4 sounds good. Like I said, we've made improvements, but um, for some of our upper, upper elementary kids, they're not really experiencing 21 kids. So that's just my statement. You can respond if you want. But. Is there anybody John, to uh, I, I did want to make one other comment that I, I thought was important in the exchange of students between Acton and Boxborough. One of the administrative problems that existed at Blanchard prior to Kansas regionalization was the volatility of the small population and managing class sizes. It was just hard to set up a place so classes got really small and therefore just unaffordable. And one of the things that I thought was very nice that you can see in the current thing is now there's balance between the classes and just to slightly comment about what uh, Tessa said. Um, because in any given class you can have a student come to school during the year or students leave school during the year, you know, there's always going to be a range of, sort of at least plus minus one student you know, along the grades, it's just impossible to not see that. So that while we, we might say that there's a difference between 21 and 23, our ability to avoid you know, experiencing that range, I would say, is, is, is zero. So it's, it's just not But I said 20 and 24, not 21 and 23. <laughs> <laughs> there's a big difference, yeah. So for the number um, that we have 67 kids left from elementary to junior high, I think, the enrollment. Yeah. So, I guess the general question I have is, since we have these kids in our school, do we usually keep our school student from junior high to in from elementary to junior high versus junior high to high school, is there usually a kind of more like a percentage of job that kids relocate, or is is that every year very different? Have we ever done any analysis for this where the 67? Is it because the kids go to private school? Is it because the most of family will allocate? Have we ever? Because I'm trying to get to see if this number it will be kind of be able to more predictable than for the future year. And the second question I have is just also a general question, which is if you take a look at the current preschool or kindergarten, do you see any kind of differences if one versus when you look at our senior in high school in terms of composition, in terms of like um, different background, different racial, dif uh, different races, or different, do you see any differences? Uh, just kind of general uh, observation, because that will affect how we're going to be able to um, plan for the future. Yeah. Um, so we did not drop 67 kids from elementary to junior high. In fact, sixth and seventh grade are very comparable. Um, total number of kids, we dropped 67 kids across the elementary school from a year ago, and we dropped 64 kids in seventh and eighth grade from a year ago. If that makes sense. So I don't. So it isn't. We have not lost a lot of kids from sixth grade to seventh grade. Um, and in fact, when we compare to other districts. There's some drop off in seventh grade, there's some drop off in ninth grade, but it's pretty small here. I want to say 3%, but I'd have to look it up. And some kids go to Minuteman, some kids go to private 712 or, or 912, but far lower than a lot of our neighboring districts. So 3% is pretty constant year to year. Can you say that? In seventh grade or ninth grade, yeah. I think. Um, not year to year. We don't, we don't lose that many. I mean, we have a lot of move outs, we have a lot of move ins. Um, but, all right, so that's the first question. The second question yes, demographically, our student body has changed significantly from our current kindergartners to our current 12th graders. I think the biggest change is in socioeconomic. 
Um, so we went, in that 10 to 12 year period, we went from two and a half percent of our students being on free and reduced lunch to 11% of our students being on free and reduced lunch. Our EL students have grown significantly. I want to say quadrupled or more, from 80 kids to 450 kids on um, receiving services for English language. Um, and then the racial makeup has become more and more um, Asian American, African American, and Hispanic. Um, all those numbers have grown a lot. Thank you. Dr. So, Dr. Bailey this morning actually talked about um, when she was a student here, we were 99% white, and now we're 58% white, 53% white. Um, I will test because it's spelled really different. I could have maybe named, I don't even know if I could have named five Asian students in my class. So, okay. if I ran it. One thing I'll add, and we're into this, but our incoming kindergarten class saw a significant rise in the number of Hispanic and African American students over what we experienced as a district as a whole. Um, and that was a significant change that Doug Bentley and I have talked about. Um, and I think it really highlights the work that we're trying to do now around equity and inclusion to make sure that we really are well prepared to, to serve all students in our district as we move forward. Just ask one follow-up question. Go ahead. So the changes that we see in our history, is that comparable to our surrounding? Is that a kind of a trend in the area? You know, we haven't done a full analysis for the area, but I can tell you statewide, we are seeing that. Um, I think, you know, a hypothesis potentially for that is as cities become more and more expensive, um, you know, we talk about gentrification of our cities, um, real estate prices are going up and, you know, uh, traditionally affordable developments in cities are now becoming you know, new developments that are no longer affordable um, to all people. I think what we're seeing is a migration of populations a little bit around the state, and we're seeing a lot of suburbs increase in the diversity of their, their residents. All right, so in your packets you have the proposed calendar for the next school year, um, and so we're making this going to continue to present. <laughs> um, so next year turns out to be a fairly simple year to do the calendar for. Labor Day is later, so it's September 7th. So that gives us a full week that we can have school before for kids. And teachers, the teacher startup days can be the week before that. So what we're recommending is that the teacher meetings take place on Wednesday and Thursday, August 26th and 27th, and then kids start on August 31st. They would go four days that week, and then um, contractually the Friday before Labor Day is a no school day, and it would be Labor Day, and then so on after that. In terms of the religious holidays, um, Rosh Hashanah is on a weekend, so Yom Kippur is on the calendar as a new school day, as is Good Friday. Um, so we thought we don't really need to explore that issue again and, and kind of go with the standard calendar that you've gone with, um, with a start for students the Monday before Labor Day, August 31st. And then end of school um, would be between June 9th and June 16th. That would be zero to five snow days, June 9th to June 16th. Um, it could, we always have to caveat, it could go longer, go more than five snow days. That's happened once or twice in the last 20 years. There will never be more than five snow days. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are headed to zero again this year. <laughs> no comment. Uh, the calendar looks great. And I do have a question. Um, the 7 to 12 early release days, there's two on the calendar with the double asterisks. What day is that, actually? We haven't scheduled them. Ah, and okay. we, don't, we don't necessarily have to book those dates. No, no, um, I'm just curious. We do them later in the year because we have to be further along with our planning. No problem. Okay. Yeah, it looks really good to me. I want to apologize to the class of 2021 because this calendar combined with Peter's good and Nintendo snow days means that the bonus for being a senior is really introduced in this calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marie. So that's the first.
first read, we would ask for your vote on November 21st, and then we can get it out to families so they can plan. Um, if there are any questions between now and then, please send them along. So next on our agenda is the resolutions for the MASC annual meeting this week. Um, so we got them out to you early so that you could take a look and make sure that you had read them as we need to give Angie some direction um, and how we want her to represent our school committee. Diana, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about them too. Do you want, uh, do, you, do we want just a consensus? Is there anything that... So this is how it goes. Angie can vote the way she wants, but it's best practice to have her mention room with eight sentences of the committee. Does anyone feel strongly, yes or no, about any of the particular resolutions? Is there anything you definitely want her to vote no on? Anything you definitely feel that we should be supporting? One resolution that I have some concerns about is resolution two, um, continue to educator diversity. And obviously, you know, I, as everyone else, would like to see an educational course that reflects our student body. Um, having said that, um, the specific element of this resolution that concerns me uh, is relates to the EMTEL. Um, and the EMTEL is the Massachusetts uh, Test for Educator Licensure. Um, like a lot of these data types, tests, like SATs and everything else, you know, there are issues around cultural bias. Um, but I do actually still feel strongly that there should be some you know, independent assessment of subject matter expertise. Now, the resolution says that you know, this doesn't prove that anybody is a good teacher by passing this test. And that's absolutely true. But if that were the criteria that we're going to apply all the educator criteria, you know, Things good that you should have on the yes from the, the teaching degree. Well, that's an improvement in the year. You know, so um, I, I think it is an element you know, that there should be an assessment of subject matter expertise. And so, therefore, you know, I would like us not to support this resolution for that reason. So, I will weigh in on that one because I have taken the MPL. <laughs> um, you know, just as many colleges have been moving towards not requiring things like the SAT and the ACT because of the reasons that you mentioned. Um, I don't know that we've developed a test that could really sort of elicit the kind of skills that we would hope educators have. I mean, there were questions on, on, on that test that are, you know, like basic proficiency as what I would, you know, say a human being needs to have. I mean, let alone a teacher, but you know, I, I don't know that it's of much value in determining who who becomes a teacher and who doesn't, and if it is a significant uh, you know, obstacle for teachers who are coming from out of state and things. Um, you know, that's the thing. Teacher licensure is not always transferable, and I don't know. I feel like we're we are definitely at a deficit of of some of the teaching staff that we'd like to be. Hiring and, and this is just another obstacle. But those are those are my opinions. Yeah. yeah so uh, when we had our previous discussion about the uh, percentage of white and non-white students in our district, that we learned that fifty percent of our students are white, roughly fifty percent are non-white. Um, I, I would be in favor of anything that removes barriers to provide an equitable view from the other side of the classroom. Uh, for our district and for any other district in the city. Um, I don't think this precludes us from putting in any requirements at our own district level around um, professional certifications that, that may exist. And in fact, what the resolution calls for is that, um, that the uh, a governance and licensure of professional educators be vested in a board comprised of licensed educators. So one of the biggest issues they have with the, with the current system is that it's made up of a group of non-educators non or at least non-licensed educators. So uh, I'm in favor of this because I would much rather see a more diverse uh, teaching population in our district uh, with the caveat that we do our due diligence in, in hiring any center. The, that was, of course, the other element of this, you know, in 
some audits, which is a question of do you have independence in your assessments? Um, and so um, there's all this challenge, right? Because on the one hand, you want the assessment to be done by people with expertise, yet on the other hand, you would like those people to be independent of the group that's being assessed. And that's sort of a fundamental part of the problem. The you know, function of our school committee, as you know, we were playing amateurs at some level, says that you know, it is not inherently problematic that people who are not subject experts provide governance for complicated activities. Um, so you know, I still, um, you know, certainly I believe that the intel could be improved. Um, I believe that um, you know, there is always going to be a tension between these kind of sort of standardized assessments and whatever else you can do. But it is a reflection of my own educational background. And I think it's sort of sad to see every assessment of this type done. Angie, I would not, um, I, would, I would go in, you know, I don't know if there's consensus for this, but I think that MTEL establishes a baseline of knowledge. It's not intended to be the be all and end all of whether or not you're a good teacher. I think that's important to establish a baseline of knowledge. Whether or not it is a disincentive for a more diverse workforce, I'd like to know more about. I don't think I have enough information. I don't like that there are no practicing educators on the, on the legislature or the people who make decisions. So to peel those two apart from each other, I support that latter. Um, I'd like to know more about the former. So overall, I don't think I would support the resolution. I think it has some good content in it. Just going through the resolutions. Um, and listening to what was said, I would agree with Diane completely on Resolution 2. The others, um, I feel, are really important. So, yeah, so I, I would say support them. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's also worth spending a minute to talk about uh, Resolution 6 and 7, which in my mind are very closely related. If resolution 6 relates to the use of quality of uh, Garden access in Massachusetts, and Resolution 7 relates to poverty and children. Um, and from my you know, current understandings, um, people have tried a lot of educational interventions, which ultimately have been concluded to be unsuccessful because of poverty. So to the extent that there needs to be a prioritization, you know, I would like to see um, the emphasis being put on poverty and children ahead of um, resolution 6, which is the UK. Uh, 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 so I'm, I'm confused. So you're suggesting that, that, so we're voting on each one of the resolutions. I don't think we're prioritizing them. So are you suggesting that we need to, that you would like to be prioritized? What I'm suggesting is that voting for everything is sort of voting for nothing because not everything can be funded. So I would vote no on Resolution 6, not because it's not necessarily something that has some value, but because I'd rather see the money energy put into Resolution 7. So I, I disagree because um, access to universal pre-kindergarten has a profound impact on especially neighborhoods of extreme poverty where there is absolutely no access. So I, I think it has, it can have a profound impact on a student's ability to learn throughout their whole education, their whole school career. I kind of agree with Amy on this one. I think that you know, the, there, there are only something like 6,000 bills that come before the legislature every year. If, if we can have a voice in some of that, and there are, and just by default, there's only going to be a very small percentage of votes that go through, so whatever important to us needs to end up um, you know, on the desks and in the minds of, of the people who represent us. All right, Angie, you feel comfortable with feedback? Yep. Great. Okay. Look at that. We're like five minutes ahead of time. All right. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So in your packets, we have minutes from the meeting of October 17th. Move to approve. Second. Uh, what, 
Angie? I'm sorry. You have to turn your mic on. Yeah. I uh, made, hold on one second, you can get my uh, comment out. I have sent a change on the, uh, under the section, challenge, sex, uh, challenge, challenge success 3.4. So, because uh, I would like to include the question that the, uh, the survey cannot grasp how we have improved the rigors uh, of our homework. And also, I have raised the concern about the gap of, um, between the elementary to the junior high and high school. So I would like to add those two questions. So, Angie, when we, when we amend minutes, it's, it's not, it, we're looking at it, we're looking at this to, to portray it accurately. It's not a transcript of what happened at the meeting, and we can't just add things that you that you feel like adding specific questions isn't the same thing as whether or not the minutes reflect basically what was said at the meeting. So I'm a little confused as to what you're asking. But that was discussed in the what we, I was I bring it up in the question in the meeting. Right, but every single person's questions are not reflected in this, in, in this because it's not a transcript. So that's a better way to do it. So if you have a proposed suggestion, an amendment to this, to change it, then why don't you send it to Beth? We will table these for now, and we will approve them at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I sent it late this afternoon, but we decided in next meeting. That, that's she she didn't didn't me. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not see it. Okay, that's fine. It, last minute is hard, so. Yeah, last minute is hard. Okay, thanks. So, it, 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 in fairness to everybody, this we were short cycle because not only would we be on Thursday and the yep. package just came out of the project. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, did you see the email from me now? Okay. So, AJ, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, all right, so Dave is up next with uh, our first quarter financial report and information on the e and certification. Okay, thank you. Um, so this presentation was made to the budget subcommittee and you've got a four page memo and some supporting documents that I won't take the time to go through in detail, just to highlight. Uh, revenues for the first quarter, we're projecting by year end to be about 188,000 to the good, compared with 426,000 this time last year. There is this, the potential for uh, some additional money from a supplemental budget that's being that's being discussed at the state house, and I explained that later in the memo as well. Uh, the memo goes on and takes about a page to detail variances for each one of the revenue items. For expenditures, I put some commentary in about uh, personnel and health insurance and the state assessments, but for the remainder of the, of the expense categories, it's too early in the year to make any meaningful uh, projections, and that's typical for the first quarter. So I can entertain questions about, uh, about where we are so far in FY20. The rest of the memo talks about how we wrapped up FY19, the uh, e and projection that I gave to you preliminarily was the one that, uh, that we were, were going to be submitting, that we have submitted, I should say, to, uh, to the state. Uh, the audit has been completed. I just received the, uh, the, the finished financial statements in hard copy yesterday. Uh, and so we'll, we'll distribute those. And we're in the process of arranging the annual OPEC meeting. We'll have a report uh, later in the year on, on OPEC. And we've begun that FY21 budget, as, as I think everybody is aware. I put in some other information on coming attractions, uh, which again, if there are any questions, I, I can answer, but it pretty much speaks for itself. And that was the four page memo, short and sweet. Um, in addition, the Budget Subcommittee got the schedule for the FY21 uh, budget development, and you can see that in detail. 
as well as the FY21 budget guidelines, and those were uh, those were discussed and kicked around at the budget subcommittee with, with some changes and, and edits made on uh, the finished product.
uh, but what we're really looking for is the official vote. Uh, I will tell you this language um, has been vetted by just about every attorney in the world. Um, there are new decks going on the back of these attorneys' houses, as we see. Um, and we're, we're proud to be supporting our local attorneys in that regard. Um, but in all seriousness, this has been through our attorneys at the district level. It has gone to bond council at the district level. It has been sent to the town, both town's attorneys, both town's bond councils. It then went to MSBA, and then we had a suggestion. So we did that process all over again. Uh, and then we had another suggestion, so we did the process a third time. So we're pretty confident at this point that, that we're set in this language. Uh, so we are proposing this um, incredibly detailed motion uh, for tonight and recommending approval of that. <coughs> I hereby move that the Acting Oxford Regional School Committee, the district, hereby appropriates the amount of $116 $28,519 for the purpose of paying costs for the design and construction of the new C.T. Douglas slash Paul, Gate, Paul Gates Elementary School and Carol Huebner Early Childhood Program into a single facility at the Gates School site located at 75 Spruce Street, Acton, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto the project. Which school facility shall have an anticipated useful life as an educational facility for the instruction of school children of at least 50 years, and for which the district may be eligible for a school construction grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA? Set amount to be expended at the, at the direction of the district's school building committee. To meet this appropriation, the district is authorized to borrow set amount under and pursuant to Chapter 17, 71, 16, Section uh, 16D of the general laws and the agreement for a regional school district for the towns of Acton and Boxborough, Massachusetts, the regional agreement, as revised effective July 1st, 2014, or pursuant to any other enabling authority. Any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any such premium applied to the payment of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with MGL. Section 44, uh, sorry, Chapter 44, Section 20, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. The district acknowledges that the MSBA's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need. As determined by the MSBA and any project costs the district incurs in excess of any grant approved by and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the district, provided further that any grant that the district may receive from the MSBA shall not exceed the lesser of one, 49.7% of eligible approved project costs as determined by the MSBA, or two, a maximum, the total maximum grant amount determined by the MSBA. And that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this code shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the district and MSBA. I further move that within seven days from the date on which this vote is adopted, the secretary be and hereby be and hereby instructed to notify the board of selectmen of each of the member towns of the district as to the amount and general purpose of the debt he already authorized as required by the aforementioned regional agreement and by chapter 71 section 16d of the general laws. Second. That was easy, wasn't it for you? For me, it was hard. Adam, could you repeat that please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were trying to get out early. Yeah. Is there any discussion? Y yes, we, uh, although I'm very happy with the motion as read, including the MSBA double code at the end. After this um, motion in the packet, there's an important letter from MSBA, um, and there are events that actually have now tripped this out. I thought it might be worth discussing at this point what has brought us to this vote, as well as saying the words of what follows this vote. So, so I was hoping you could speak to the letter that we received from MSBA. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, too. <laughs> I was wondering if you wanted to put that for a readability calculator, too. Um, so, yeah, we had an opportunity on October 30th to go to MSBA, which was their formal board meeting, and we received the MSBA's official authorization to proceed with the project, and we received word of the maximum feasibility grant. Um, the way they stated in the letter, you know, we've been talking about $38 million was the estimated grant. 
that continues to be the estimated grant, but a piece of that is based on the contingencies of the project. So a portion of our overall project budget is contingency, which means we don't spend it unless we need it. And so MSBA reserves a portion of their reimbursement as contingency as well, but they don't reimburse us unless we spend our contingency. So that's why you see a couple of different numbers um, in the letter. Uh, essentially, what this letter triggers is a project scope and budget project funding agreement with MSBA, where we cannot, we will not receive any more than their maximum reimbursement. And the maximum reimbursement eventually is subject to an audit process. So they withhold their final payment until the project is fully audited. And so if you change the scope of your project along the way, when they conduct the audit, if you've done things that don't, were not proposed in the original funding agreement, they reserve the right to reduce your eventual reimbursement. So that's, we had a couple of questions that came in about why could the reimbursement be lower? We didn't fully understand that. And it's really based on that final audit of the project where MSK determines your final payment amount. Um, the big piece that this triggers moving forward is we have 120 days to secure funding from all communities for this project. Um, and as you know, that takes the requirement, there's four votes needed to fund this project. Um, there is a special time meeting that needs to take place in both back in Boxborough. At which time there'll be, a, you know, there's an article that goes in the warrant and then there's a motion right on the floor, which is similar to what you did. Um, although at the town meeting, because the towns have to authorize uh, funding for this project and they are the, the town meetings of the appropriate body for that, that carries with it a clause in there to require a debt exclusion in order to do that. Um, that piece of the article language in the town meeting warrants will actually then trigger the need for a vote and a ballot the subsequent week. Um, so it's kind of a tricky process. There's four votes, um, but essentially what we're triggering is coming up special town meetings, and then following that ballot elections, the town meeting is to approve the project itself. The ballot election is to approve a debt exclusion to fund that project. And that's, that's the way those two things play out. I just wanted to point out that the town meeting um, vote requires a two-thirds vote to approve, whereas the ballot vote requires uh, just over 50%. Okay, there's a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that passes unanimously. Another quick building project update. Last week we posted a forum at the Douglas Elementary School on the school building project. Um, it was a small group, but it was a great group in that they asked some fantastic questions. They had an opportunity to tour Douglas um, and were, you know, the reactions were somewhat horrified. Uh, when we brought them into that basement level of Douglas, um, which is typical standard reaction to the basement level of Douglas. A um, couple of things we have updated our building project website subsequent to that. We do have a video online now uh, on our building project website where people can actually see uh, the existing conditions of both Douglas and Gates and hear the principals explain um, what's going on in those two facilities. Um, I want to thank Acton TV for working with both of our principals um, and at those schools to be able to put that together. I think that's important for the community to really understand why we're doing this project. I think the other element I want to highlight is Acton TV did film the forum last night, including all of the community questions that were asked. That also has already been turned around and is posted on our website. Uh, we also posted that to the two different social media pages so that it's accessible to as many people in the community as possible. All right, uh, we have subcommittee business up next. So, um, Amy, would you like to speak to policy? Yep, we had our policy meeting last Monday, and um, in your packet is the proposal for uh, our tutoring policy, but I'm going to let Marie speak to it. Um, I think we can, as long as we acknowledge what we're doing. Okay. Okay, so I, I skipped over something on the agenda because all I saw was meeting minutes and current flyer, but there, there is some special town meeting planning that we need to discuss, so. Um, I think it's really kind of announcing. So maybe it's okay. easier to do that now. Okay. All right, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite a sound Do you mind waiting a minute, Marie? Um, we have presenters as, as school committee, and so um, it has been 
decided that in Acton, um, John will be introducing the project, right, and reading the uh, board language. Yes, so yeah. typically in each time meeting there would be a 10 or so minute presentation providing some overview of the board and then introducing the article for discussion. So I would do the other hand and stuff. Okay, and then Peter is going to do the uh, presentation that goes along with the building project. Um, and in Boxborough, um, I will introduce the Warren and Mary will do the presentation. Mary Paul will do the presentation. And just for anybody who's completely clear, the time the time we need to run in at the same time, as we have a divided right. actor strategy. Yes. Okay. And I think, and just so you know, next steps on that, I think um, Tessa, John, and Mary, and I need to sit down and actually start that plan now for exactly how that's going to be presented and who's saying which portions of the various presentation. All right. Now, <laughs> Marie will. Um, talk about the, the two-ring for pay. So in your packet is uh, a draft of the two-ring for pay policy. Um, over time, we've learned that um, updated ethics guidelines and rules around um, things like tutoring have changed over time, and our policy was not consistent with current ethics rules. Um, in particular, we did allow um, teachers to use classrooms for tutoring outside of school hours with permission of an administrator. Um, the guidelines do not allow for that anymore. So we have updated the policy. The policy subcommittee has worked through it over a period of time. Um, it is truly to be consistent with the ethics guidelines. So there's an FAQ, and there's a link to the FAQ, which makes a lot of the questions about it clear that we put into the policy. Um, we sent it out to teachers, both as a communication process, so they're aware that this change is coming, and um, for their feedback, and we got some feedback, and we processed it at the last um, policy subcommittee meeting. So this is the first reading for the public. We are recommending, so we've sent it out to teachers who have gotten feedback. We're recommending that in the next couple of days we send it out to families so they're aware that this is coming. Um, we may get some feedback from that as well. Um, we will bring that back to the next policy subcommittee meeting, which is November 19th. And then, assuming all goes well, we would bring it back to the school committee for a second read and vote on December 5th and with an idea of implementation on February 1st. So we have notified teachers that February 1st would be the, the date we're targeting for implementation, which is essentially the beginning of the second semester. To add one thing to that, because I think, um, you know, we know this is a significant change for a lot of our community, and we don't just want to have a change without a solution. And in all honesty, one of the effects of this policy going into effect is actually around equity and making sure that we have equitable access to all our school programs, whether or not someone can afford tutoring. Um, and being able to afford tutoring should not be an indicator of how successful someone is in our schools. What we want to develop next are actually free uh, after-school tutoring centers that are funded by the district, uh, which are essentially drop-in centers for the junior high and high school, um, where we staff them with teachers in English language arts and mathematics, at least to start and see how that goes uh, with a set number of staff. We're hoping to start that uh, this year to be able to see what we can get going. It will certainly be a pilot year, but then reevaluate that into the next school year. But, you know, uh, fundamentally, our belief is that all students should have access to answer help for your charge. Yep. Can a teacher be listed as a tutor on the website? That's all it said. Yes, we are um, going to go back to having a tutoring list on the website. We can't discriminate against who would like to be on that list, so anybody who requests it could be on it. So we put in a little bit of information about the tutor so that families would have something to work from. There will be a disclaimer that we're not recommending, the district is not recommending any of the tutors on the list. It's just simply a vehicle to make a list. 
They cannot advertise, though, in the schools. They can't tell their kids, their students, that they're available for tutoring. And nobody's ever been able to tutor their current students. That's always been a rule. Um, but there's, they're not allowed to use school resources to um, share the fact that they're available for tutoring. If someone asks them, they can respond, but they cannot bring it up. Um, so my second question was, um, can a teacher tutor for free? And the reason I'm asking that, um, that a teacher might, might want to, um, but there are tutoring centers that are free too. So I'm just kind of curious about the whole like, free thing. That now um, Peter brought up the equity piece, which is really important, and I think that should be pursued. But there are centers that offer free tutoring outside of the schools you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do, how is that off limits or not? Um, I, no, I, I wouldn't see that as off limits because they're actually, I think, in that role working within the capacity of their job. Um, as a teacher in our district. I think the issue with the ethics policy is that essentially when a teacher uses our facilities and receives payment for that, we are providing access to a teacher to run a private business in our facilities for free, and yet we're not providing that same access to anyone in the world. Uh, we essentially could have continued to allow teachers to access our facilities for free to provide tutoring and run businesses, but then we would have to open up our schools to anyone who wanted to run business out of our school free of charge. And that is not an option, really, in the educational world we live in. We can't control student safety, we can't control faculty safety. There's too many considerations around that. So really what we need to do is make sure that we don't provide access to certain people for free so that they can run a more profit business. So certainly to students free of charge and providing extra help teachers have done that since the beginning of time. And I'm sure that with our teachers that a lot of that practice will Bullet 4 says, um, after the Marshall Regional School District, teachers may not recommend that one of um, his or her own students receive tutoring. Rather, teachers should offer extra help and support materials for their students. So I, I was intrigued by that. Um, I, I, get, I get that, that you know, this isn't passed, that the current policy doesn't kind of pass the same test. Um, who is better equipped to know if a, if a child might need tutoring and teachers, which it, it kind of seems like a gag order. And, and it, um, I'm again using kind of powerful language on purpose. Um, and so when I look back at the FAQs, um, the, the, the second clause was, and receive pay. So can you explain how that ended up here? That, that is not required by the ethics guidance. That was a choice of the policy subcommittee. And um, to be fair, this was originally drafted by last year's policy subcommittee in the spring and then uh, continued to be worked through this fall with kind of a lot of change in committee makeup. But um, I think there was a strong feeling that, um, so first of all, our teachers do give extra help and there's a lot of it available and um, we want that to continue. We know it will continue. Teachers go above and beyond to support their students. Um, I think there was a feeling, and, and people here were there to talk about it, so feel free to add in, but that um, if teachers are recommending tutoring, then there's maybe stopping short of doing everything they could do for the kids, um, for their own students. But does somebody else want to? Yeah, so, I mean, I recall having this conversation last year as well, and I think, you know, what, what's really interesting is the, the third bullet, which says that anybody who's in a supervisory role cannot tutor. And so the thought was, uh, if I recall correctly, we talked about the fact that a, a, a teacher who's providing that direct instruction should not recommend that someone requires tutoring. That they should be the first person. But because this, the, the department heads in particular are not able to provide the tutoring, the thought would be that in consultation, either with the teacher and the parents and the student, that person who is sort of in the department lead role could say, hey, here are the things that we've done. You know, the teachers made themselves available for extra help, but there may be some other resources that you may want to take advantage of. And so, uh, if I recall correctly, we talked about that person who was in a supervisor position who's precluded completely from providing the tutoring as being that person who might be able to work with the family to, to help suggest other uh, options. I, I 
think there's another lens on this. Uh, if I put my, you know, I, and I'm not the expert in special education, but if I put my hat on the thing about special education, the teacher is acting as an agent of the district. And if a teacher is saying to a family that your student can't make effective progress without additional support, they're essentially, as the district recommended to the family, that the student needs additional support services. Um, we have a range of support services that go through the process within the school. Uh, but if the district is going to recommend support services that are outside of our purview, then there's a high likelihood that we need funding for the services too. And I think there's a caution around that. Uh, so I, I think there's really a fine line. We need to make sure that we have a robust set of services. And the services we don't have, that we should have, we need to put them in place uh, within the district because that's pretty appropriate for all students. But I think um, uh, there's a real danger to people acting as an agent of the district making recommendations for outside services. I think that's, for me, that that's what the genesis of it comes from my standpoint. And, and you know, the conflict of interest laws do say that that committees can be even more restrictive than the conflict of interest laws say. I would just caution that, um, and I understand the constraints, the constraints on the public school model. I also um, just makes me a little uncomfortable um, thinking that a student might not have access to what he or she might need to be successful in school because of our policy. So I want to give that a little more thought. It's complicated, and, and I, I understand all the complications of it, but I appreciate you bringing this forward. So Diane, in me reading that for the first time, because I also read it, my thought was that that was included because it's almost like jumping the chain of command for a teacher to say, I think the student needs to, or more eloquently the way Peter said it, that you know, you know, right, that they weren't able to make progress without adding support. And so to me, I would hope that the teacher would think, oh yes, this teacher, this student would do better with tutoring, but then would bring it to whatever uh, process exists, whether it's junior high, high school, the elementary school, to get more sports for that student, rather than, like, this prohibits them just from telling the parents, is how I read it. So one thing that I'm very sure of is that families in the district are very keen that students have the best opportunities to learn and enjoy education, um, and this robust discussion about tutoring is a reflection of that. Um, and, and I think this subject comes up a lot uh, in terms of what can we do from tutoring to various enrichment activities and how does it all fit together. So that um, I hope that you know, as we work on these policies and elements of this, you know, we look at district as to you know, how we can wrap this in a larger uh, message about you know, here are a range of things that you might consider as part of your child's educational experience. You know, starting with the classroom and ending with some crazy levels of enrichment lots of things in between so that uh, you know families you know in conjunction with you know, the advice from the leaders in the district can navigate that to try and put plans together that are going to work for their particular students. Thank you Marie. All right uh, next is Diane um, an updated budget with the updated charge. So we voted on this We have a charge, we have a schedule, we have budget guidelines, we are ready to go. The budget subcommittee met last um, on October 22nd to review the uh, quarter one budget, February 20 update, which you put in our packet. Um, we've been paying close attention to budget variances over the past few years, and this year, as you saw in the guidelines, we set a target for total variances of between 0 0.5 and 1% of the total budget. So we talked about the budget variances in various cost centers and productions going forward. So our next meeting, actually, don't sure. is it next Tuesday? Central. Okay. Uh, we also, oh, one more thing. Um, the, we did talk actually about capital planning. Um, Chuck Flagg, who is our project manager, um, who we hired to receive our, our capital plan. Is, um, is hard at work and, and um, some requests for proposals right now for design on, on some projects. All right, we have ways or reports, and John, I know that I don't see HIT on here, but I know you sent the one more report, so would you like to report?
our back class, not that. I would love to. At the health insurance trust meeting on 31 October, the draft audit for FY19 was reviewed. For the year, operating expenses were $17.6 million, and unrestricted assets of the trust were $6.9 million on June 30th. Uh, cash flow for the first quarter is consistent with the cost of loss of $1 million for FY20. For the preparation of FY21 budgets, the trustees have provided health insurance premium guidance for a rate increase of 4%. Uh, the actual rate setting will occur at the December meeting. Uh, the trustees will trial a packet approach for distribution of documents pre-meeting, like the school committee packet. Um, and I'm very pleased that um, the reading has offered the support of their call in preparation of those packets. Um, Todd uh, Bigstrom will continue to support the trust by acting as a recording secretary. Um, and I would also know that the Health Insurance Trust now has a web page on the recording committee's page on the Town of Active website, so you can go to one place and find our stuff.
So on an annual basis, we actually bring you the list to approve um, of all the clubs and activities that are running at the junior high and high school. And that was done, I'm going to say in September or in the August business meeting. I think we did that. Uh, and so when a club no longer runs, you don't approve it for the following year. Now the, the catch is, you approve the clubs that have an associated student activity line item. You don't approve if there's a club that has no funding that in fact can start to run whatever it wants to. Uh, but yes, you actually see that on an annual basis. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, those pass you. Okay. Sorry, okay, go ahead. All right. Is there a motion to approve the donations? So approved. Second. With gratitude. <laughs> it was impressive. It's $5,500. Yeah, $5,500. Yeah. Very much. Very, very it doesn't say it on my highlighted <laughs> chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the addition, John. Um, are all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that passes you. All right, there are any warrants on the agenda, and I know that Dave wanted to highlight any answer to a question that was right. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you may know, that, and Adam did, that there are a couple, there are two uh, sets of invoices related to P-card transactions. One of them is in with the set, the regular vendor warrant, um, and it's because, and, and the other one is the detail and formal approval of the transactions that occurred in July, August, and September. The, the first three months, we used a different bank account to make the electronic funds transfer to the, uh, the P-Card uh, bank, just to maintain visibility for a new program. We've since changed over to the regular vendor account, and so you see this normally occurring now with the regular uh, vendor warrant. We just wanted to get comfortable with the new process and uh, document and transaction flow, but now we have a, a normal process. And it's a little field. I was assuming this would be after you talked about the, uh, the warrants, but just in case you're interested, the departments are using them with, with some increased frequency. We're still, my department is still evaluating the overall efficiency, but so far so good. And. Um, all users uh, have been authorized consistent with the procedures that we established. Okay, so now I'll Sorry if I can hear you off. I just thought it would be awkward to stop in the middle. So, vendor warrants 20-009 in the amount of $1,810,877.70. 20-009PR in the amount of $1,057,291.87. 20-009PR in the uh, 20-010PR in the amount of $533,792.34. 20-008PC in the amount of $20,621.94. Student Activity Fund Warrants 20-009JH in the amount of $10,033.92. 20-007SH in the amount of $27,452. And payroll warrants, P2009, P2009 in the amount of $2,573,765.81. And P2009, PR in the amount of $1,050,000. Any abstentions? Any opposed? Any abstentions? So we have a need to enter an executive session to convene, convene under MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Anti-Boxcar Education Association, ABEA, because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee, and MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Purpose 7, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal granted aid requirements, MGL Chapter 30A. 22F to consider approval of executive session minutes of the meeting on September 9, 2019. We will return to open meeting for the sole purpose of adjourning. 
Is there a motion to enter executive session? So moved. Is there a second? All right, we will do a roll call vote. Yes. 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 